This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. Welcome back to Open the Voice Gate, and welcome to Speed Star, a career retrospective of Masato Yoshino. We are members of the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. You can find us in the Voices of Wrestling feed or on the Open the Voice Gate dedicated podcast feed on podcast platforms and applications. You can follow us on Twitter at Open Voice Gate. If you'd like to donate to the show, click the link in the show notes. It'll take you to our redcircle.com landing site. You click the red box that says sponsor this podcast and you can set up a one time or reoccurring donation. And that's the usual intro, but now we're just going to get straight into it. This is Speed Star. It's Mike. Join alongside Case as always. And we have a special guest with us, Case. And I don't want to waste our listeners' times. So I don't want to waste our guest times. Let's just get straight into it. Rich Krejci, the captain, the person whose bandwidth that we inhabit, and also huge Masato Yoshino fan. Absolutely. So, yeah. Thanks for having me, guys. So, Rich, the, the, the reason that, at least for me, I was like, okay, we have to have Rich on this immediately first up. Is I remember on a Patreon Q and A, someone asked you about singular wrestlers, or like wrestlers that you're guys. And the first one that came to your not, your mind was Masato Yoshino. So I figured like a good way for us to start off was just talking about like your experiences with Masato Yoshino as a wrestler. I think you had a chance to see him live a couple times, I believe, with like Dragon Gate USA in that area. But just just overall, like what draws you to Masato Yoshino? Yeah, and, and it's actually interesting that you mentioned that because there was that Patreon question and somebody was like, hey, who's like an unheralded guy that you really think is like one of the best wrestlers ever? And, and that's that's one of those questions like I'll usually do the i I'll, I'll ask for questions like the night before. Uh, and then they come in and then I'm just tossing and turning all night thinking of answers to these questions because I'm an insane person and, and a weirdo. And I remember that when I read that question, I'm thinking, all right, who's who's a guy that like, you know, not the basic one that everybody knows, like who's a guy that's really like, a, a you know, deep down one of my favorites. And then I got to thinking about like, OK, there's probably somebody from Dragon Gate, but who is it? And then it dawned on me and it was Yoshino. And I was just like, wait a minute. Yeah, Yoshino's just awesome. And then like I spent the rest of the night basically going through his cage match, going through, you know, you, you know, cases reviews, going through, you know, my spreadsheets, going through Voices of Wrestling Match of the Year countdowns and being like, God damn, like this is the mo- one of the most unheralded great wrestlers of all time. I mean, when you just add in the amount of. Just the, the, the sheer um, number of great matches this guy has had over the course of his career. And, and the thing that really attracted me to him as well, and, and it's like you said, seeing him live is a whole different animal. And and he, you can get the speed, you can get the athleticism, you can get the smoothness, you can get all that by watching him on video and watching him on, you know, Dragon Gate Live or watching, you know, you, know, you can get all that, but it's just something different different when you see him live and i've had the pleasure of seeing him live at one ring of honor show no not that ring of honor show i went to the other year one not the one that everybody knows about uh, i went to the better than our best one with alex shelley and jimmy rave or whatever which was not as good it was it's, it's good uh, but not quite as good as as, as the famous uh one from uh you know from the, the the night prior but then i also saw him in dragon at usa and i saw him a few times i'm kind of looking at I'm, I'm trying to look at it right now to see which ones i did and i don't i definitely know that i saw him dragon kid versus masato yoshino at the lovely Congress Theater, at the open the uh, Untouchable Gate. I definitely was at that one. I'm pretty sure I was at Fearless as well, the uh, World One International or World One uh, versus Kamikaze versus the Young Bucks. And then I also, unfortunately, believe I was at the Chuck Taylor, Masato Yoshino, and Ruki Doi, Sammy Callahan match at <laughs> Untouchable 2011. So um, I have seen him live a few times, and yeah, it was immediately you get drawn to him, and and immediately you're just like, this is just a different animal than all these other guys, and it's it's. You know, I've seen a lot of really, really good wrestlers live. I've seen guy, somebody like a Ricochet, who is somebody I bring up all the time, that the live, you, you don't really appreciate Ricochet until you see him do what he does live and just how head and shoulders more athletic and, and, and smooth he is uh, than, you know, everybody that he's in the ring with. And Rashad Yoshino was that times like a thousand. It, it was just, it was unbelievable to see this guy live. And, you know, I, I think it's unfortunate that, you know, now that we're kind of winding down in his career and we're getting to the final few days here, that... And, and, and we'll talk about it, I think, throughout this next you know 45 minutes or, or an hour or so. One of the issues that I think he is going to have when, when people kind of talk about greatest wrestlers of all time or guys that they really like is similar to a lot of Dragon Gate guys. There's not really a ton of, okay, 
you know, somebody asks you, okay, oh, you, you love Masato Yoshino. Okay, what are your favorite Yoshino matches? And it's like, I, I can give you like 45 that are pretty good, like that are really, really good. And I can't necessarily give you like the three that you absolutely have to watch. And I think that's always an issue with the Dragon Gate guys. And it's an issue with Shima, you know, when, when, when I try to, you know, defend him for, you know, when I vote him for the Wrestling Observer Hall of Fame, it's like, all right, cool. What are like the definitive, you know, three Shingo matches? And it's like, I mean, I don't know if I can give you just three of them. And it's, it, it's more about the consistency of greatness throughout, you know, the last 15 to 20 years. It's about the consistency of pretty much every single time. And it's just about the just sheer number of matches that he's had over those last 15 to 20 years that are just tremendous, tremendous matches, even if there is not one or two, in my mind at least, definitive uh, Yoshino matches. But uh, yeah, he, he just easily one of my favorite wrestlers to ever watch. Uh, you pretty much every time you know that you're going to click a match that has Yoshino in it, you're going to get something that you like. Uh, and, and yeah, seeing him live is just a totally, totally different experience. So I'll always remember that. And, and and yeah, he was an easy person to bring up when someone said who's like an unheralded, you know, great wrestler of all time. He, he was an easy choice for me. It's a strange dichotomy where Yoshino is a wrestler who, if you see him once, you will likely remember him for the rest of your wrestling fandom. He's an unforgettable wrestler just off of his speed and what he does. Just running the, the ropes alone. once. I, honestly, exactly. running the ropes one time and you're like, that guy is insane. insane. <laughs> who? How does he do that? And then you'll remember him forever. Yeah, it's nuts. But, but to your point, when Mike and I started doing this project, in my mind, I was like, oh, well, there's all of these Yoshino matches we have to talk about. And then Mike said, pick one. And I went, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, okay, I'll pick this T-Hawk match from 2015, which, which <laughs> admittedly was an odd pick, but it is, it, it is a great match. Did you struggle at all, uh, with coming up with a match that you brought to us, or was that kind of an immediate, like, okay, I know this is the one that I want to do. No, no, it was a huge struggle. It was like, it seemed like you said, you got, you guys, you know, said, Hey, can you pick one Yoshino match that we're, you know, we're all going to watch and talk about. And I was like, Oh, pff, easy. No, no problem. Let me head over to the old cage match match guide. Okay. What are ones that really stand out? And then I'm looking, I'm like, ah, that's those, those are all really good. All right. Well, <laughs> well, let me go look at my spreadsheets in the past and see which ones I rated pretty well. And it's like, all right, well, here's, you know, 35, four star, <laughs> you know, five, four and a half star matches that I rated. I'm like, okay, that's going to be a little tough. And it was just like, ah, just this one, I guess. I don't know. It was, it, it, it's, and that's a weird thing about uh, about him. And I think it really does apply to a lot of Dragon Gate guys as well. And, and whether that's good or bad or or whatever, it's just a, it's an interesting thing about that company is that it it becomes very difficult when you have to like sit down and, and pick the definitive match or, or a definitive match of a wrestler. It's just it's it's very difficult. And Yoshino might be the hardest I've ever done. Of just like I I don't know. There's 35 matches I think that that are are, are what I would call quote unquote definitive matches or ones that I would really really recommend people check out. And, and it's something I would say that Yoshino is unique in that unlike Shima, who you've brought up, who his best work by far is in his tag and trios wrestling. Uh, Masato Yoshino, you can make an argument evenly talented between his uh, singles work or his tag team work. Like, I mean, the the first episode zero was just talking about his singles work. Today, we're talking about two tag team matches and then a three-way 12-man tag. And it's just one of those things that at least, like, tackling this thing, at least, like, I had an overall idea is, like, we'll be piecing together this thing. So we, we pick a match each time to further p- kind of piece together somewhat of a mixtape in a way because you can't just say, like, Oh, Masato Yoshino, you need to watch this one match. It's impossible. It's not like with uh like Masaki Mochizuki where you immediately go, okay, you go watch the Shingo Takagi mm-hmm. match from 2016. It, it's one of those things that he's he has such a varied uh just match history in a lot of ways and against a lot of different opponents as well that you can't really like pick just one. And it's one of those things that it's very interesting, at least I think, within the company, because a lot of people have identifiable rivals. Yoshino has his rivals and his relationships but other than naruki doi who they kind of don't have very good chemistry to, against each other as, as singles wrestlers not really i mean i guess you could claim kness and dragon kid but they really that that's stuff that you're really getting to the weeds of that point. yeah and i think one of the things that's interesting about it is you know and you, and you mentioned it's a lot easier for like american wrestlers i think it's pretty easy most of the time to say if if you know somebody said hey you know what's uh you know, Mick Foley's best, you know, the A&E documentary of Mick Foley was just, you know, a, a few days ago. Hey, what's what's the best Mankind match? Like, pretty, people can pretty much come up with three or four different ones to give you the, the match against Shawn Michaels. You know what I mean? The, if, if you want late career stuff, the match against Randy Orton, you know, at Backlash, you can do that pretty easily. Or you can get eras. Oh, well, watch him during, you know, WCW 1992. He's, he's really great there. That's another thing that I think applies to Yoshino and maybe all Dragon Gate wrestlers as well. But particularly in Yoshino's case, that like, I can't even give you like, a oh, well, definitely watch this stuff from like, you know, 2009 to 2010, because it's like, you know, 
the matches from 2005 are as good as the match in 2008, which are as good as the matches from 2015, which are as good as the matches of 2018, like pretty much until like right now that we're talking and, and this last year, the last, you know, year and a half or whatever, pretty much every other era of Yoshino, there's something to like or something to kind of sink your teeth into. So it's you can't even slim it down from that. Like you said, you can't give you can't give a rivalry. You can't give singles versus tag. And you can't give a single era because he's just been really, really good against a lot of different people for a long amount of time. And it, it, it makes, you know, projects like this very, very difficult. And and in some cases, I think it might make people think, oh, this guy, oh, he's, you know, you say he's really good, but you can't, you know, you can't give me the, the best of the best. And it's like, I, I don't, it's so hard. Like people that really know, know, like you guys know, and, 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 and you know, I know and, and stuff and people that, you know, follow Dragon Gate know this, but I could definitely see from the outside world where you're thinking, oh, this guy's one of the greatest, but you can't even give me, you know, his top five matches. And it's like, I, I, I don't know. I can't because, you know, there's 27 singles matches that he's had that I, I, I think I, I rated highly or really, really liked. It's like, how do you, how do you slim that down yeah the the answer is 20 years of unbridled consistency and that has become one of my my new big talking points is you know the the original dragon gate class and even those t2p guys they're at 20 years you know at least of their career right now which is an abnormal run of excellence i just recorded a podcast with wh park talking about kenta kobashi and Kobashi maybe has 18, 19, or if you really want to be generous, 20 great in-ring years. And you look at a guy like Yoshino and he's at that point too. And I'm not saying it's a one-to-one comparison of, you know, Yoshino and Kobashi, although that's certainly an argument that I would like to have at some point, but it's, yeah, it's the entire career is your argument, whether it's Yoshino or Shima or Shingo or Mochizuki or whoever, whoever it is you're talking about rich i want to ask you this uh just because uh, of what you were talking about how some of his so much of his career kind of blends together for you personally uh between yoshino's sort of start in the dragon system as a member of the italian connection he would go on to blood generation and muscle outlaws as a heel and then turn face with world one junction three monster express maximum and then his time in the Torimon generation is there a specific era of yoshino's career that you enjoy the most i would say it's probably a tie between the the, the world one era which i really really liked and then the monster express era which which i absolutely uh, adored and i've probably i i think i i've talked about monster express at least on the on the voice wrestling flagship a bunch which was just somehow the most collection of of, of rich crate wrestlers ever it's essentially as if they asked me hey who are your favorite guys in dragon gate we're gonna put them all in a unit at the same time and you're gonna love it and guess what i did i loved it it was like a, a perfect uh, you know collection of guys but i would say my favorite version of yoshino my, the, the favorite you know era of yoshino is probably the world one uh era just because i think that's the one that i i, I most remember you know the high level matches from and i just most remember kind of following and watching and, and kind of my peak i don't want to say fandom of dragon gate because i don't think it's ever kind of waned it's kind of always kind of stayed the same but i think my first real I think I think that was an era when I was really diving into Dragon Gate and watching every single show that made tape and every single thing that made tape. So I kind of I, I I will always sort of side with that era a little bit more than than than, than others. So yeah, I'd say I'd, I'd say probably the World One um, Yoshino. And, and I think that like if you have like a mental image of Yoshino, I think that era really stands out because he had blonde highlights partway through it. He was wearing this the bright silver and gold gear he it was probably the most mid breathed out that he ever was <laughs> in his career and it just is one of those things that kind of like resonates with you whereas like monster express as i'm looking at a monster express t-shirt in my office it just was such a fun collection of guys in satyoko machine you know like just all these dudes together Watch and it. it's one of those oh <laughs> i'm just kidding, I'm, kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I'm not gonna say any sachi slander because we'll be talking some sachi in, in, a, in a couple of minutes but it, it's one of those things that after the face turn and really starting with like blood generation, when you got out of being sexy Tarzan, it, it's hard to like pick out a time frame as well, just because it's not that he doesn't like evolve. Like his, of course, like you get older, you evolve your wrestling, but like uh, you, you take a look at a photo of him in 2006 and you take a look at, at him from 2019. You're like, okay, 13 years have passed. Same guy versus like someone like Ginky Horiguchi who just has some years that he looks insane. So I, I think, but like the, but getting back to your point, Rich, like the, the world one with like him and then like, with like that first speed muscle run. And then you also had like BB Hulk in there as well. It's just like, it's very identifiable. I feel like in Yoshino's overall career. Yeah. When, when I close my eyes and I think of Masato Yoshino, it's like, it's like you said, I think of that gear. I think of that run. I feel, I think of that hair. Uh, and, and, and yeah, that I, I don't know why exactly. It's just, yeah, it is. It, to me, it is the most memorable and the most obvious. So 
as we have done before on Speed Star and as we will do into the future, each of us picked one match that to bring to the table that we're going to discuss, kind of figure out, like, is this a definitive Yoshino match or not? Is this one of the ones that when people ask us, like, the three matches now, instead of giving them three, we'll give them a list of, like, 12 because that's who we are as people. But we have three matches that we're going to talk about this week. Uh, Case, yours was from Kobe World 2017. This was the Open the Twin Gate Championship match where the CK1 team of Shima and Dragon Kid face off against Maximum's Speed Muscle Doyoshi. And then, Rich, you had one of the matches that, if you did not pick this one, I was going to pick this one. So this is one of, I'm really glad that we're covering this with you. It is from April 9th, 2015. It is also for the Open the Twin Gate Championships. This time, it is Amigo Tag of Masato Yoshino and Sachi Hoko Boy from Monster Express against the original Jimmys, Jimmy Susumu and Jimmy Kagatora, also known as Yokosuka Ichome from the Jimmys. And then my selection... I just picked like a real batshit uh, three-way elimination match because I knew Rich was going to be on the show. So we're getting into elimination rules matches. <laughs> this is from 2016. This was the elimination three-way losers disbands match from February 4th, 2016. It was a Monster Express team of Akira Tozawa, Masato Yoshino, Sachioko Boy, and T-Hawk versus the Die Hearts team of Masaki Mochizuki, Dragon Kid, KZ, and Big R Shimizu versus the Berserk team of Shingo Takagi, uh, Naruki Doi, Yamato, and Katoka. So Real interesting selections we have here. Uh, guys, which ones uh, Which ones do you want to lead off with tonight? Let's go uh, chronological. Let's start with Rich's match, the Amigos Tag versus the Jimmies. So, I did just off the bat, this might be my favorite Dragon Gate Cork and Tag Team match. Like, I know I've said this is the case before, but Rich, what brought you to bringing this match to the table uh this is one that as i was kind of searching through past you know match ratings and and and, and different things and and looking at my spreadsheets and looking at you know the, the cage match you know match guide of of yoshino this is a match that as i was scrolling i immediately stopped on this one and went man i remember this match but i i don't know if i remember everything about it and i looked back and i saw my ratings and i saw that i really really liked it and i went back and looked at other reviews and a lot of other people really liked it and i was like yeah i i remember this one this one was pretty damn good wasn't it and then i went back and watched it and What's weird about this match is I think it's about I, I don't have the exact runtime in front of me, but I don't know, like 24 minutes or somewhere around there. It might even be a little bit shorter. And if you watch it, the first 10 minutes, you're like, I don't I mean, I guess it's fine. Like, you know, it's decent wrestling. These guys are out here doing some stuff. And then Yoshino gets a hot tag in this match. And then it proceeds the next eight minutes proceed to just be the most crazy, insane Easily the most like the, the, if you want to show people and melt down what Dragon Gate is to somebody and why what Dragon Gate can do that almost nobody else you know no other wrestling company can ever do it's the last you know eight to ten minutes of this match where there is just a thousand things happening everybody is exactly where they need to be every single thing matters every single thing is good uh, every single thing is impactful the crowd is going absolutely insane and, and I think what it also speaks to as well and this is kind of the the big reason why I chose this one is I think it to me represents Dragon Gate in a lot of ways of and, and, and Joe and I always talk about this on the flagship. The really cool thing about Dragon Gate is that at any given moment, on any given night, anybody in that roster can 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 be a top star. Everybody in that roster can be the top guy. Anybody in that roster can be the most over person on an entire show. And you have these kind of you know, land of misfit toys. And then also Masato Yoshino obviously does not belong with these other guys where, you know, Sachioka boy is, as you said, you kind of joked about him a little bit earlier, a guy who has bounced around many, many different places and many different times and has never really been a top guy. And then you have the Jimmies, which, you know, by their very nature are kind of like, you know, I, not, not losers, but, you know, just sort of, they're not the stars. They're not the biggest type, you know, you know, guys. And Susumu speaks to that as well. Like a guy who is never the top guy and never, you know, the champion, but, but on any given night, can be incredible it could be the best guy in the entire roster and the most over guy in the roster and Kajator is the same way as well you forget that he exists sometimes then he comes out and he has a match like this and you're like Jesus he's so good he's incredible and I think that's that's what really spoke to me about this match is is not only the crazy last eight to ten minutes which are just absolutely absolutely insane uh but it also it's just it, it's a it's a collection of talent that on any given night can come together and make magic like this and it doesn't matter if they are the lowest guy in the totem pole it doesn't matter if they're the 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 lamest guy in a unit or whatever on that night 
if they bust their ass and if it just all kind of works out, they can be the biggest stars. And, and and this is a night where, yeah, this is just a random tournament match. You know what I mean? It's just a random tournament match in Cork. And then for some reason in the last eight minutes, these guys decided, ah, fuck it. Let's go crazy. Let's go nuts. And, and, and yeah, the, the roof is blown off this place. And these guys are the biggest stars in the universe. So I just thought it, it to me, it's just a great representation of Dragon Gate for somebody that maybe is even not as familiar with Dragon Gate or, or isn't as hardcore a Dragon Gate uh, as, 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 as like you guys are. This was a really buzzworthy match when it when it happened. Uh, this was still at a time, and, and we'll kind of talk about this as we go along, of the the dichotomy of Dragon Gate and how it drastically changed, especially in terms of Western perception from 2015 to early 2016 to mid-2017. And I know because I was covering it all that, you know, my interest and the interest of the American fan base and the European fan base was drastically different for really all of those years this was one of the first matches where it felt like dragon gate had some momentum and obviously new japan was the prized possession among puro companies among you know uh the western audience at the time and it remained that until now where it's uh there there are no winners in that battle uh with new japan really falling off the mat of the way they have but this was one of those matches that I think really made people take notice and go, okay, I have to start following this promotion because, you know, by this point, the flagship is up and running. You and Joe are talking about Drangate on a, on a pretty consistent basis. And you guys were getting sucked into the stories just like I was at the time. This is right before I started covering the promotion for the website. Uh, I'm sure Mike was watching at the time and loving every second of it. Let me talk about real quick how we got to this point. It's a pretty simple build for this match with Yoshino and Saji Hoko Boy. They beat Yamato and Cyber Kong for the Twin Gate belts a month earlier, March 1st, 2015 in Osaka. After the match, Sachi Hoko Boy got a thunderous ovation from the fans, and it was noted by Jay in his iHeartDG recap that Masato Yoshino was moved to tears <laughs> by his post-match promo in celebration Obviously, uh, the Jimmy's good guys all the time. Susumu so and Kagatora would challenge them later on in the month. There wasn't any uh, real giant build to this match other than, hey, you guys have the tag team titles, and we would like to have those. Uh, strangely enough, in the history of Masato Yoshino's career, uh, you know, he's a four-time Dreamgate champion. He's won King of Gate twice. He's done all of these things. This reign right here is the last time that Yoshino ever held the Twin Gate belt, and it was his first reign as a Twin Gate champion since 2008, which is hard to believe because when I think about the Open the Twin Gate division, I think about Masato Yoshino. I think about Yoshino, Yoshino and Sachi Hoko Boy. I think about Yoshino and Doi, who we'll talk about later on uh, in this podcast. But it's a pretty simple build here. And then as Rich said, we, just, we, we have a match that is seeping with emotion it's unbelievable what these guys were able to accomplish in 27 minutes and i've always felt like i'm the low guy on this match i think i like this match less than everybody else on this podcast and and certainly in the the grants uh the the bigger scope of things i don't think i'm as high on this match as other people is but i still love this match it's something that i and i think this is something when when we talk about uh people getting to dragon gate like the preconceived notion that it's a very tough company to kind of pick up on and to follow this match if you look at it was a very kind of simple tag team match and i think that's something that really shows like the wizardry of masato yoshino the understanding of okay satyoko boy was never a primetime player was being elevated at this time and this whole entire tag team match was okay masato yoshino is going to destroy uh susumu's arm to try to prevent the jumbo no kachis which paid out towards the end and then we're going to send in Sachi in to get the scraps. Well, like he's going to get in there and then, oh, wait, Sachi's in over his head. Time for Masato Yoshino to fire up and do the incredible hot tag, do a back body drop that Shingo Takagi, who was at ringside as a member of Monster Express, was visibly excited to see him just do a back drop. And it just was something that, like, I felt like that this is something that with, like, this kind of series and, like, when we talk about Yoshino as a tag team wrestler, like, laying out a match like that, that's not dissimilar to what you would see in, in tag team wrestling up until really the Dragon Gate influence kind of kicked in there. I mean, it, it was a very simply told match that you just had, like, you would think that uh, Sachi Oko boy was the prime minister. He was that popular. Like, it was insane in there. And it's one of those matches that I always kind of keep close to my heart. And it's something that makes me very happy that this match happened and it's and it's thought back on. And we all are have very warm feelings towards it because it's, in a lot of ways, this was Sachioko Boy's run. And the fact that he made it in a cork and hall where they all were chanting his name towards the end as he got the win. 
was just like an incredible moment and it's and it's one of the great reasons that dragon gate is this kind of promotion because you, you can't expect like other promotions to take someone that's like a scrub and be able to get the crowd's investment into it that right. completely sold out cork and just goes insane for him like that yeah and, and that's why i say and that's a big reason why i chose this match and, and i mentioned it before it's like oh, very few companies can do this and do this well uh and do this and have it not feel like i, I, I the, I'm, the words escape me but some companies will do this sort of thing but it, it just kind of feels very token and very I, you know, like, yeah, all right, we've beat this guy like a drum for years. All right, let him have a moment. Let him have this match or whatever. And it doesn't it doesn't feel like that for this. It's like, you know, and, and that's something that Dragon Gate is very good at doing is that everybody kind of feels like they're on a certain level until they decide, okay, now you're up. Like, nobody ever feels like they're they're down in the dumps or they're a job. Or, I mean, eh, these days, maybe because there's so many guys on the roster and there's very clear, like, you guys are in the openers every single time uh, uh, feel right now. But at least at this time in Dragon Gate, it didn't feel like Satchi Boy was, was like a lower guy on the roster he was just like not a upper guy you know what I mean? he wasn't you know to the other level the other guys but they can on any given moment on any given night with any given person just say okay tonight's your night let's do it and 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 that's what they did here is they put him in this main event and they said let's go crazy and hey you're going to be with masato yoshino and what you're going to do is you're going to be neck and neck with masato yoshino and, and you're going to what, what masato yoshino is going to do he's going to elevate your game at the same time like you you guys are going to be on the same team the hot tags to him are going to get the crowd excited but then you're going to bring him home and i think that is just an awesome awesome moment and something that that just no company could do like like only dragging it can do it and make it work as well as as they do here Rich, why do you think that is? Is there like, because the only term that really comes to mind is when a promotion other than Drangate tries to do something like this, to me, it comes across very self-aware and almost like, oh, yes, we're putting, the, like, everybody recognizes what the situation is and it doesn't really feel authentic. It's like almost like a, a, a gold watch run, even if it's, you know, some sort of tag team situation. But the Sachi Hoko Boy run, which is prevalent in this match and then prevalent in the match that Mike picked as well, like, that stuff that is now, if you started watching Dragon Gate because Pac returned in 2018, you would have no idea that at one point, Sachi Hoko Boy versus Shingo was the hottest <laughs> feud in this promotion, and that people in Cork and Hall were standing and pacing because Sachi Hoko Boy wanted a piece of the baddest man on the planet. And it to me, obviously, as a fan of this promotion or someone that has dedicated a lot of time to it, that all comes across very authentic. But I do think there's something uniquely exclusive to Dragon Gate in that sense, but... I can't really put my finger on what it is that they do compared to other promotions. I think it's just precedent. I think it's just something that they have just always done. And and and, and fans, I think the, the Dragon Gate fans know that and respect that. They know that everybody on this roster, pretty much everybody on this roster, is as valuable as the next guy. Like, yeah, this guy is currently the champion, but but you know, we know that, you know, his time will, will, will potentially come and go and then he'll kind of move to the back and then another guy will come up. And it's it just uh, no, most other companies, it would be parody booking. Most other companies would be 50 50. Most other companies would be like, oh, who are the stars and who are the, you know, and, and, and that's true because they haven't done a, jo a great job over the last 20 years of establishing that everybody on the roster is important. But but Dragon Gate does do that and they do it in, in a very bold way, you, you know, on the other side, too, where like we're talking about currently as we're recording this, Ben K is just kind of. You know, just floating around doing nothing. You know what I mean? Ben K. I mean, obviously, this King of Gate is, is you know, through a little bit of a wrench in it. But, you know, for the last half a year, Ben K has just been on the opener, just been doing stuff in the in the undercard. But everybody knows that at, at the end of the day, like he is going to be one of the biggest stars in that company. At the end of the day, he is eventually going to get back to the top or whatever. But they do a really good job of cycling people in and out uh, and keeping that stuff fresh. And I think. I don't know if there's any kind of secret sauce other than you just have to do it. You just have to do it and establish that that happens in your company. And and, and I think, you know, Mochizuki is a great example of that as well. I mean, on any given from, uh, you know, from one week to another, he can be on the opener as just as likely as he is to be in the main event and it matter and people care and people, you know, be invested in it. And that's, that's just, yeah, that just takes work. That's just 20 years or whatever, 20 plus years of just hard work and, and developing that and, and building that confidence in your fans that, that they know, Everybody on that roster is important that on any given night, that guy could be the top guy. And, and it's something that I think that you have to have the right fan base for it. You have to be like, get so used to it. And it's something that like case and I still talk about the fact that, that Ginky Horiguchi was made in one night and made the backslide, the most over move in the company. And it's something that like it's commitment and believing in your fans. And you like, you look at like King gate right now. And that kind of gets into someone that is, I guess, going chronologically in the next match we'll talk about kz kz in 2016 was a lost post he was always very good at it i have jokingly 
refer to him as like he is making the Roman aqueducts of the of a lost post. He's that good of one. He's that much of a cornerstone. But like the company understands that like okay, if we present this to our fans in a way that's not going to insult their intelligence and it gives them an emotional investment, then yeah, Sachioko Boy for a period of about fifteen months will be one of the keystones of the company and, and we'll have a feud with our champion here and it would be like the big crux about a huge split that happens later on in 2015 and it's something that i don't know how other companies can kind of teach that i think it's something that you either have to start doing from the start or you're just never going to be able to do in a way and- yeah i think that's i think that's very well put and i think that's incredibly incredibly relevant to your match mike where you have a million guys you have a million things going on it's chaotic to the outside viewer, but I also think if if you have any sort of appreciation for this style of wrestling, it's something that's very appealing and that you want to dig into more. Kind of the argument that's been made a lot with AEW of, you know, the idea of the casual fan probably doesn't exist in the way that people think it is because people, you know, people are dumb, but they're not dumb in the way that they think they are. And I can imagine if you throw a match like two, four, 16, that unit disbands match in front of a person who understands wrestling, but maybe doesn't know every one of the guys in this match. To me, that would be an obvious match where you would go, okay, I have to figure out who this KZ, who, who this KZ guy is. I have to figure out why Yoshino essentially took a bullet for one of his partners in this match. I have to figure out why Shingo is so upset at everybody and who the hell is this Sachioko boy guy? Yeah. So this, as I mentioned at the top, this is the Dia hearts versus monster express versus Berserk. Uh losing unit must disband uh, just so that people can understand that what the rules were basically the first team to lose all of their members of their team. They all get eliminated. They lose the match. The match is over. And then that team is disbanded. I, I think sometimes Dragon Gate gets a little bit too cute for themselves with some things. I feel like this is like one of the more simply simple things here. And the thing that got me on this match, and I was wondering if, if on retrospect this got to y'all, did this feel like a different style of like the traditional Dragon Gate like multi team, multi man matches where there was like no stalling? Because it felt like this match is twenty four minutes that they had a flying start where everyone was brawling around Cork and Hall, and then just from there onwards they just went for twenty four minutes. Yeah, Rich, did, did you rewatch this or were you going off memory on this? No, I, I rewatched this one. And uh, first off, I want to say, how dare you make me watch an Akira Tozawa match? How dare you? <laughs> hey, <laughs> it, it hurts me more than it hurts you. I know. I was watching this and my first note is, why would you make me watch an Akira Tozawa match? Because I was just, I wanted to cry. And then he goes in here and that, that sequence that he has with Mochizuki is fucking insane. It lasts like a minute, but it's just so incredible. And then I just like, I close my eyes and I just think of him as, you know, dressed as a ninja running after, you know, Fucking well, not Tucker anymore. They fired him, but uh, some you know some dork and, and some WWE twenty four seven dork. And I'm just like Rich. He's actually having the time of his life, and you need to respect the fact that he's <laughs> right, yes. uh, wearing a ninja costume. It's actually very disrespectful of you to criticize yes, his current yes, run. Yes, yes, yeah. But uh, yeah, it was it was it was pretty shy. But yeah, no, I rewatched this one, and it is it's it's chaos. It is. Uh, and this can be a kind of a theme for all these matches. It's yet another match that like only Dragon Gate can really pull off where you're just your head is spinning. Guys are running in. Boom, 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 boom. Things are happening. Guys are yelling. People are screaming. It's 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 madness for a little while. And then what, what does happen, you know, pretty later on in the match, which I really like. And, and, and again, another kind of hallmark of Dragon Gate is things will slow down a little bit. And then you start to get, okay, here are the real guys. Here are the guys that are really being focused on in this match. And, and here are kind of the important moments. And, and then that action is obviously pretty hot and heavy and, and, and real fast. But, uh, yeah, the beginning of this match is just insane. As there's just people coming in and out. And you're like, who's with who and where's with what? And I get how it would be confusing. But, but you get it pretty quickly and you understand it pretty, uh, 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 pretty shortly. But, uh, yeah, I, I really, really liked uh, rewatching this one. This is a match that I, I didn't really remember all that much so i did have to go and 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 check it out and uh since we're sticking about yoshino i i I absolutely love when he um there's a spot here where big r does the shot put slam and yoshino does a hurricane rana out of it and pins him for the one two three and i was like jesus this guy's so good (laughs) like it's it's, like in rush like turning uh you know uh an attempt like a high choke slam into a perfectly you know performed hurricane rana pin is just i mean come on that's ridiculous like nobody should be able to do that and he does it I will say this about this match, and and by February of 2016, I am covering Cork and Halls and big pay-per-views for Drangate over at VoicesOfWrestling.com, so you can read my review of this entire show, uh, Drangate Truthgate 2016, if you'd like to throw that in the Google machine. Uh, please don't judge my writing in 2016. I hope it's improved since then. But at the time, 
this to me feels like the apex of interest in Dragon Gate among Western fans because you're in the midst of the incredible Shingo Takagi open the Dreamgate run where he buzzsawed through Fuji and Mochizuki and Shima and then 10 days after this match he would lose the belt to Susumu and then regain the belt to Susumu a month after that. Uh, this is you know you start having Tozawa get mixed into the Dreamgate picture again. You start seeing a guy like Casey who we now you know we're, we're recording this on on June 1st by the time this episode's out, KZ might be in line to challenge for the Dreamgate belt at Kobe World. It wouldn't shock me at all. But at the time, this was uh, certainly the talk of the town going like, oh, KZ got into shape and he no longer sucks. And he's no longer annoying to watch <laughs> wrestle. This is kind of a, a a delightful change. And then you had... He Verzer did. I do want to point out, though, he did look like an absolute dork, though, in this match. Like, I forgot how <laughs> terrible his gear was. And then because it was like, I watched this I watched this, and I immediately went and watched the King again. And I'm like, oh, my God, like the presentation of KZ is so much better. His hair and his gear is so dorky here. You're like, oh my god, I would have fired him on and the this spot. This was an improvement. This was, an I know, that's for like Afro era Mad Blanky, where he would come up with a jumpsuit. So yeah. things were looking up for him, and you had, you know, Verzerk at the time, Shingo, Doi, Yamato, and in Kotoka, and they they were just killers out there. This was this unbelievable unit that, you know, for as much as I like what a lot of Red is doing now, and I think the dichotomy between Ata and Sb Kento is something that will grow as we head into the summer months. I think that. That's super interesting. To me, Peak Verzerk is the greatest, maybe the greatest unit in the history of Dragon Gate, but certainly the best heel unit they've ever had. And all of this comes together in this match that I have very fond memories of. I have said that, you know, I have nine, or I, I'm sorry, I have seven matches in the history of the Dragon system from Toriyaman to Dragon Gate USA to Dragon Gate UK to modern day Dragon Gate that I have given five stars to. I have seven matches at five stars. This would be my eighth favorite match in the history of the dragon system. I love this match so much. It's as close to a five-star match without being one as you can possibly get for me. And if Mike didn't pick this this week, I was certainly going to pick this the next time <laughs> around because it's, it's, it's unbelievable. And it is just one of those matches. Like I would almost as a dare, I would just love to see any other promotion, try a match like this. Cause it would wildly entertain me. It, it's something that like, it's not just like how insane it was. These teams were like perfectly constructed teams for these matches. You had like the the big leaders, and then you everyone had like their dork slash fall posts in here. You had like your young hot talents, like Shimizu, like the bringing up like the awesome way that Yoshino eliminates Shimizu. This was like in like supernova phase Shimizu, where Shimizu was beating everyone with a shot put slam, and the fact that someone was able to get out of it and pin him out was such a huge thing. But yeah, no. I, I would love to see your. Uh, I'm trying to think what, what, what uh, major mid major promotion would be funniest doing this. I mean, WWE is so old hat at this point. I want to see Ring of Honor try this and not be allowed to have Flamita in on. Yeah, if you have like if you run that back with Dragon Lee and Bandito and Flamita, it's like well, it's like not drag, It's like Diet Dragon Gate. But if they do that with their core roster, Kenny King K I N G <laughs> Red Titus, I would like yeah, to, <laughs> Red yeah, Titus getting the hot tag. Yeah, <laughs> I would Back like. I think that's, the, yeah. <laughs> that's the perfect comp. Is like these are all pretty much. I think with the exception of of Mochizuki, Dragon Gate Trueborns, guys that came up in the dojo. We need this match, but only with guys that trained in the Ring of Honor dojo. Oh, God. So, Quinn I, McKay. <laughs> yeah. uh, 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 this. Uh, Mandy Leon. Mandy Leon, of course. Yeah, yeah. It, and then at a certain point, we have to go through the top prospects tournament and see who all they had this year. Who has been? You don't want to do that. Years. I did that recently. You do not want to do that. Let me just let me just tell you. You you that the top prospect tournament is a uh, it's something. Don't yeah. Do not go through those old tournaments. You you would be very very surprised at how terrible oh, they I are. I think yeah. if uh, if we have Grizzly Redwood just take all of Sachi Hoko boys. I was spots, gonna say to yeah. It's there. not. I mean honestly, Shane Hagedorn. If you take that early class, like that early Ring of Honor class, and your Shane Hagedorns, your your, your Mitch Franklins, your Ernie Osiris's, I think you could pull this off and make it work pretty well. Uh, it's just the later classes that get a little, little, little tricky here when you're, when you, when you need Will Ferreira and you know, like <laughs> the dogs are out. Yeah, the, yeah, you don't want to have to call the dogs, but uh, yeah, you do it with that early run of, of Ring of Honor. I think, yeah, because because those guys had that sort of, you, you know, Gabe when you speak to dangerous. it, yeah, it's it's it, Ring of Honor, and especially with you know early Gabe stuff and, and and Gabe obviously being inspired. 
uh, in some ways by Dragon Gate. They had a really good crop of those guys that like Mitch Franklin, that, you know, Grizzly Red would be that way sometimes where he'd be in openers, but sometimes they would put him in the main, you know, on the main show. And he's like the most over guy in the entire show because you're like, hell yeah, Mitch Franklin, let's go. Like uh, Pelly Primo, I know, did that a few times as well. So they, they did a good job of, of, of uh, sprinkling in the young guys and, and, and making them pretty good. And, Pretty important. There sometimes. was an excellent uh there there was an excellent Shingo Takagi versus Pele Primu <laughs> match from a 2007 fifth year festival show. It is oh if you if, if you put those two in the ring and you go, hmm, I wonder what this is gonna look like. <laughs> uh that's the match. It uh rough day for Pele, but a very fun match for the fans involved. <laughs> I, I'm right now just really imagining Ernie Osiris in Katoka's gimmick right now. And <laughs> that's giving me some energy. That's that's like much much needed here. Uh it the, the the thing about like this match and the thing about like the the big feud for people who weren't familiar with late 2015 or early 2016 ring or during of Dragon Gate now I have Ring of Honor in my brain what what's wrong with me but uh, the idea of Takagi turned on all of Monster Express upon winning the Dreamgate title from Masato Yoshino at Dangerous Gate 2015 and decided the same night that Mad Blanky disbanded that they he was going to form a group together with people that were of Mad Blanky, Katoka came from Millennials. Ata was a part of it until they all turned on Ata because no one liked Ata back then. And the the big thing about Shingo Takagi leaving uh, Monster Express was how much he thought that Satoko Boys, and I have this carved into my brain case because I remember that this from I Heart Genius Must, a piece of luggage was the, <laughs> was the term that Shingo Takagi used, which I have to say, for Shingo, that's actually, you know, pretty kind, I would say. But like the way that it all played off here with like him and Shingo in this match, and then him eliminating Shingo with the M9, which is you know you don't get to see a whole lot of like rolling prawn, uh, uh, code reds. Like how did Sachi Hoko Boy get like such a like a cool power bomb move out of nowhere? Like, like that's not how wrestling should off. Yeah, there's a five minute stretch in this match that kind of begins with the Tozawa eliminating Mochizuki, and then. Sachi Hoko eliminates Shingo, and then 15 seconds later, Doi eliminates Sachi Hoko Boy, and then kind of that period right until Dragon Kid gets eliminated from the match, where it is so heated, and I think that that is a real testament to the Dragon Gate style and to the booking of the promotion at this time, is, yes, there's a million things going on, and it's easy to get lost in the big spots of this match, but this is a... 12 man match where you have i think 10 total pinfalls and every single pinfall really mattered and the crowd was invested whether it was kotoka taking a fall or shingo taking a fall or t-hawk taking a fall it's amazing that everything worked into this perfect storm and then at the very end and this is not necessarily specific to yoshino but to have Yamato and Doi be the two survivors in this match, to have them stand so tall and so dominant, eliminating KZ, ending Dia Hearts, which was not a spectacular unit by any means, but one that I always I always really enjoyed. Uh, the evolution of Dia Hearts, of course, starting with Team Pantaloons, where Hulk, Mochizuki, and Dragon Kid wore baggy pants, and they are like, hey, this should be a unit. You guys are pretty cool. And then it evolved into Big R Shimizu joining and, and really getting the first big break of his career. And then KZ as well. That unit ends, by the way, of Yamato and Doi. And I guess I can throw this question out to both of you. And we can go to Rich first. Uh, when you think of Dragon Gate tag teams, when you think of you know, the dominance and the lineage of the Open the Twin Gate division, do you have a preference between Yamato and Naruki Doi, who were killing it in this era, and Masato Yoshino and Naruki Doi, obviously the legendary speed muscle team. That's tough. It's so hard because, yeah, I, I, I think in my heart of hearts, I think I kind of like the Yamato Doi more, but I know it's like sacrilegious because the, you know, Yoshino and Doi are so good, but I, it's so hard. It's so hard to choose between the two. I think I, I, Mm. I think I enjoy the Yamato one a little bit more because I think I I I, I like um, the Yamato Doi connection a little bit more, but I don't know. It's Yoshino Doi is so good, and I think the main thing that makes Yoshino Doi so good is that you know that it's like going to end very soon. <laughs> and I think that's always the best part about it <laughs> is that you, you it's very fleeting, and you're like, oh man, like they're gonna lose, and this guy's gonna turn on this guy so soon, and I can't wait for that. So maybe there's a nervousness uh, always when I watch a Yoshino Doi. Uh, a, a match versus when I watch, uh, y- y- you know, Yamato and Doi. But uh, I think I like Yamato Doi a little bit more, but I, it's it's a very slim margin. I mean, they're both just incredible all-time great teams. Yes. Thank you for joining the Dark and Lightning side. <laughs> so, I know. Uh, I, most Yamato. people are going to be upset with me, so I, I, I feel bad. Yeah. So 
yeah, it's Yamadoi. Yamadoi had the best tag team title ring in Dragon System history. Like the way that they finished this match, because the survivors, Yoshino survives this match. He just disappears for the last three minutes because he knows that it's KZ's time. So the, the the finishing stretch that was Yamato with his sleeper hold into a suplex that looked brutal, into a Bakatari sliding kick that looked brutal, into a spike Galleria on KZ. Just like the way that these two guys, who I I I've, I'm well uh, I'm well out there thinking that Naruki Doi is one of the best tag team wrestlers of all time. If you look at all the different tag teams he's had and and just the way that Nuruki Doi's brain operates, he's just spectacular. But you add in someone like Yamato, who at, at the time there was after his Dream Great runs, before his big run, and these two guys, like, they they looked like the coolest motherfuckers. Like, like they would come out and like and, and like their crazy gear. Uh Nuruki Doi would have silver hair, Yamato would have his mirror, and they would look like absolute Bond villains, and they wrestle kind of like Bond villains. Whereas Speed Muscle, I mean there's not going to be another tag team like Speed Muscle. Like, like I think that's not a preposterous statement to make. But you, they have like all athleticism, the, the double team work. They have the chemistry. They have the charisma there. But but Yamadoi was just something different. And I don't think like as much as I say there's not going to be another Speed Muscle, it's going to be a long day until you get two people with like the same kind of charisma and chemistry as Nuruki Doi and Yamato as a tag team part. I will say this, and I, I, I apologize if there is more to say on this unit disbands match. We can always backtrack, but Yamato and Doi gave us the tweet of old man Doi and his lovely niece. And if you know that tweet, you know that tweet. Whereas Speed Muscle, <laughs> and I do want to talk about this with Rich pretty extensively, uh, Speed Muscle gave us the, I've seen 25 or so Speed Muscle matches. None of them have done a thing for me post <laughs> yep. on the pro wrestling only forum, which I think that was posted in like late 2014 and between me, Joe Lanza and rich. I feel like that still comes up like once a month. Uh, it is my favorite uh, self own of all time. And we could talk about that when we move to my match. Is there anything else we wanted to say on the units of fans match? No, I think we're good. I'm, I'm yeah, good, Rich but yeah, that that is that is an all time uh, message board post, and yeah, for people that don't know the background, I, have you have you ever ranted about the, uh, the the PWO message boards and your your trials and tribulations there, or no? Well, we, we talked about it quite a bit when we were doing the greatest wrestler ever shows with uh, Alan Forel on the Pro Wrestling Torch, where I, I would just try to paint a perspective for people of, you know, obviously Alan and I know that Yamato and Naruki Doi and Shima are all time great wrestlers. That board is more interested in discussing four minute Wolfie D matches and trying to find some really great hidden gems there, specifically the the Doi and Yoshino post, which I'm I'm trying to find right now. It's you know, uh, it's very difficult. I tried to find it very recently when it, when it came I, up I, recently. I, I, I can it, grab it in just a yeah. second, but it is basically in 2016, Pro Wrestling Only was hosting a greatest wrestler ever project, and they wanted to do an offshoot of I think it was like the 50 best tag teams of all time. Doi and Yoshino were nominated, and before I could make my case in the thread that, you know, obviously Masao Yoshino and Naruki Doi, one of the best tag teams of all time, uh, up there with Kenta and Marafuji, and this was coming off the heels of a man who we all like, Dylan Hales, saying that he could name 500 tag teams better than Kenta and Marafuji. And Joe challenging him on that, and, <laughs> and, and Dylan, to his credit, got to like 120. 15 and then it then it kind of petered off a bit and then he was just like throwing out <laughs> right right there the was like twice. guys like, that like, one match on. together we're like okay all right we're done here we're done here. <laughs> but but there is a thread on pwo about yoshino and doi and i have no problem calling him out by name uh there's a guy named bill thompson he's a public figure he can be you know he can be brought up here who uh, at one point had criticized hiroshi tanahashi for having bad moonsaults on, I believe that was the F4W board. And we were like, oh, maybe a different guy, Bill. Maybe that's not who <laughs> you're referring to. And, you know, this is a, someone who is very into the grapple fuck era of Evolve, big Timothy Thatcher guy, loved realistic and sensible wrestling, just like good old Jim Ross. And he decides to pop in to the speed muscle thread on pro wrestling only and go, yeah, not a fan. I've seen about 25 or so of those matches, and none of them have really done a thing for me. And before I could make the save and go, I don't think that's right, uh, Joe Lanza comes into the thread, makes a message board post, and calls bullshit of Joe basically saying, look, I've watched these guys since their first tag team match together. I don't know if I've seen 25 <laughs> speed muscle matches. I certainly know this motherfucker has not. 
and uh it dawned again something that i still laugh about to this day yeah just the incredible the, the good old days of message boarding when when you really had to you had, you had to bring it like these twitter kids they don't know they just dunk recklessly and they just dunk all over the place the message board days you had to come correct and you had to have your research and you had your thing ready and you would stew too that's the best part about message boards it's like somebody make a post and you you could just immediately reply, but it was better if you thought about it a little bit, researched it a little bit, got into it a little bit. I mean, that, that's just classic message boarding right there. But uh, yeah, that was about the time when I decided I don't think Greatest Wrestler ever was uh, was for me. When, <laughs> when, when, yeah, when we were having the discussion, he was saying, well, maybe it wasn't 25. Maybe it was like 15. And it's like, it wasn't 15. You've never seen, you've maybe seen one match, maybe, of those guys. Just stop lying. What are you doing here? Like. You probably watched that one match on TNA, Bill. We, we, if that, that, I don't even know if he's on that. Like it was, it was, yeah, it was, it was a classic. Like little by little, it got down to essentially him basically admitting that he had never seen them ever before. So yeah, <laughs> and even if it was the TNA match, the Speed Muscle versus Motor City Machine Guns match, that's like that's a universally it's a very beloved good match. match. Yeah, that's yeah. like one where everybody turns their brain off and they go, you know what? This is cool as shit. This is very good. I like what's happening in the ring right now. And again, I don't even know if he's seen that. Uh, he's certainly at the at the time because it hadn't happened yet, but I, I don't think Bill Thompson has gone back and watched Speed Muscle, Masato Yoshino, and Naruki Doi versus CK1, Shima, and Dragon Kid from Kobe World 2017. This was my pick. Uh, this is, I think, one of the better Speed Muscle matches of all time. I picked it because Masato Yoshino's 2017 began uh, the second show of the year, he suffered a herniated disc and a fractured vertebrate, taking some move from Cyber Kong. Uh, that is the injury that has really plagued him over the final four or five years of his career. And there's a reason that he's now hanging up his his Nike tennis shoes, not his boots, because he's never really been a boots guy. But there's a reason he's hanging up his Nikes, and it is is largely due to this injury that he suffered. This happened in January of 2017, and the general thought at the time was that we might have watched our final Masao Yoshino match. And even if he returns, one, he certainly won't be the same, not with the style that he wrestles. And two, it'll be 2018 at the earliest that we see this guy. And instead what happens is he does a John Cena-like comeback. He returns three months later and then begins wrestling pretty much a full-time schedule. And it all builds up to this match at Kobe World 2017 with four legendary wrestlers, legendary singles wrestlers, legendary tag wrestlers, legendary wrestlers in and out of the context of Dragon Gate, Shima, Dragon Kid, Masao Yoshino, and Naruki Doi. And what I think is, you know, we talked about two matches that took place in Cork at Hall, and those felt big and they felt heated. This really, I think, has the energy and the the pacing of Dragon Gate on the biggest stage of them all. This, you know, wasn't like one of those slow Dream Gate matches. This was kind of one of those slow build Twin Gate matches. And I, I, it is one that I've thought fondly of ever since it happened. Uh, real quick, Mike, do, what are your memories of this? I mean, this was like during a pretty controversial time because the CK1 team, I feel like has, history has been a lot more fond than the discourse was at the time. Uh, the, we talked about Doyama. CK1 had the longest title, Twin Gate title run in Dragon Gate history. Uh, and, and the idea of, like, they were in the middle of this monster run at this time. And everyone was like, all right, what's going to happen? Who's going to stop them? And then who shows up there? Oh, it's the people who created these titles. It was uh, Nuruki Doi and Masato Yoshino. And, and, and I know, case we've talked about Kobe Worlds previously. And we've talked about this one. But this is, like, such an interesting match that, like, when you like you look at like the overall show like the show was pretty much predicated on this match like being outstanding and it ended up being one of the best tag team matches that dragon gates ever had and which was good because yamato versus t-hawk was a very good match but that was not the match that people were really were signing up to uh i think at this time they were still on nico nico to watch they weren't signing up for their smiling points to to watch <laughs> that match yeah, no, you know, we talked about 2015, like there's there's definitely buzz to Dragon Gate, and you can tell that something's happening here. February 2016, and really, I think through July when Yamato beat Shingo for the belt, to me, that feels like the apex, at least in times where I have been watching Dragon Gate, where there were the most eyeballs on the product. In a year later, by the summer of 2017, People are dipping out because Yamato won the belt at Kobe World 2016 in what I thought was a perfect build. Everything they did to get Yamato the belt from Shingo Takagi was 
perfect. And then everything they did afterwards seemed wildly miscalculated because Yamato's Dreamgate run was essentially delayed by the Summer Adventure Tag League. And then Akira Tozawa, sorry to bring him up again, but Akira Tozawa announced that he was going to the WWE. And at the time we were like, oh no, Akira Tozawa, please no. And five years later, we're still saying, no, please come back. Even though I know you're a wife guy and you love hanging out with your wife in Florida, please come back to Japan. I beg of you. So Yamato had this Dreamgate run that just brought down the entire promotion. Like these shows just became a drag to review because I knew even if the Yamato match was going to be good at the very end of the show, I just didn't care. He wasn't over with me. I didn't like it. I wanted the belt off of him. And one of the few saving graces at the time was this twin gate run by Shima and Dragon Kid. Now, if you go back and listen to the Open the Voice Kid archives from around this time period, and I don't recommend that you do, but if you decide to do so, uh, you will hear some people on those podcasts be very, very critical of Shima and Dragon Kid as champions, perhaps even Shima as a person, which I can't speak to. But there was definitely a level of like, we don't want these guys holding the Twin Gate titles. They are not our guys, and we're sick of them. And this is at a time where, again, interest is waning anyways. So now it was just a mess of nobody was over, nobody liked the champions. And luckily, through all of this, we were able to get a great match. Uh, Rich, did you have any memories of this uh, prior to this podcast? Uh, a little bit, yeah, because I do remember this one finishing very high, and I actually wanted to look it up. It, it finished 50, uh, 53rd in the uh, Voice of Wrestling match of the year, which, uh, honestly, for a 2017 Dragon Gate match is not bad. Yeah. Like, it's, uh, that, that's a win. That's, that's a, a win, that's yeah. a win that's for our yeah. brand. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, getting it that far and, and that high and getting a few first-place votes uh, is definitely something. Yeah, so I remember it from that aspect, but it's a match that, like, when I read it, I was like, yeah, I, I remember this but i don't i I definitely need to go back and rewatch it to kind of fully understand and 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 fully uh get it again and i think one thing that hit me immediately is the ages of these guys as well and another thing that again like i think speaks to dragging it it speaks to a a point case that you mentioned a little bit earlier that like you know the original class is like 20 you know know, these days 20 years into their career or whatever shima is 40 dragon kid is 41 naruki doi is 37 and masato yoshino are 37 like it is unfathomable they are the ages that they are when you watch this match because it is just it's awesome action one of the aspects i love the most and it's just it, it, it encapsulates yoshino in just a perfect way he tags in and he moonsaults into the ring just because he's a fucking asshole you know what i mean like why 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 are you doing that like because he can because he can flip but he's just like yeah look at me i can flip and it's like fuck you you know what i mean like could you imagine having the physical capabilities to do that like yeah. if you could just moonsault into you know your office or whatever which i would love to see that if you want to moonsault into your office tomorrow i do and i don't think just... i can i can barely walk up the stairs to my office like let alone <laughs> moonsault into it like jesus and, and this this is a guy who again six months before this (laughs) people were like oh he's he might not ever wrestle again i talked to wrestlers at the time who had been in the ring with yoshino and and i remember specifically one guy telling me he's like i just don't like with what he does i don't see how he can continue wrestling with this injury it just seems like it's going to be an impossible uphill battle for him and this was an injury that was supposed to keep him out for a year and six months later he goes you know what I'm going to moon. <laughs> right. And right. Then, and it goes on to have this 20 minute twin gate epic. And it's, it's just absolutely absurd. It's classic. Like just like, it, it reminds me very much of uh, when, when Shawn Michaels did that right after WrestleMania 13 or, or right in the build of WrestleMania 13, when he was, ah, I got to give the title up. I can't, you know, my knees too shot. And then he, Gets in the ring and does a moon salt and it just lands and just Bret Hart's just seething like you fucking asshole. God, I hate you so much. And that's well, kind of the, the energy that Yoshino gives here. Where you're, he's like, "Oh man, I almost never. You know, I could barely even walk, and I was never going to wrestle again. Oh, and no, I'm fine. Look at me. Look at me do what I do. It's just like, God damn it. Like, how dare and, you? And you and you can imagine Shima being the Bret Hart there. Just you're right. Like, exactly. Yeah. Asshole. Exactly. Is this asshole tags into the ring and it just it's like it's not even like it's an active match going on. And he moon salts in for no reason. It's just. Uh, incredible but uh yeah this this again i'm kind of being like a broken record here but i'm glad we these three matches i think are are, are really really awesome matches because they all speak to to just the uniqueness of dragon gate and this is another one that i i just don't think any other company but dragon gate can do no other company will keep a roster together for 20 years no other roster you know no other company will have this sort of collaboration between their guys because 
every you know everything in this match that, that that goes 20 plus minutes everything is just perfectly done seamless transition from one move to the other nothing is fucked up the crowd is going nuts the entire time these guys are defying their ages i mean they're just an unbelievable you know and and you know the last few minutes are just insane there's just a thousand things happening your heart's racing and it, it's just yeah it's stuff that dragon gate does that that almost nobody else in the universe can do and and you know these days they don't do it quite as much but sometimes they can kind of surprise you a little bit but especially you know and and like you kind of said case this is maybe that last era of when dragon gate really felt like it could do matches like this even though it had been, been doing matches like this you know for the last 15 years or whatever but this is like a really good i, I think it's a good way to kind of finish the show and finish these three matches because it's like it's a great send-off to like yeah even in 2017 even as their bodies are starting to break down and even even as the company is beginning to fracture and 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 go in their different ways or whatever these guys are still capable of when that bell rings to go out there and just to have a match like this that that there's no other no other wrestlers no other company could do something like this it's just it it, it's out of this world good yeah and it's something that we said some speed muscle slander a little bit ago uh, well, we like doing compliment sandwiches here. Here's something f- about about Speed Muscle that's so special. It's not that they do like this spectacular double team work as like the finishing stretch, though they will do some of it in the finishing stretch, especially doing like Torbellino into the Bakhtari slide kick. It's the fact that that when they start going, when they start flowing, when they start doing the real double team stuff, it's in the middle of the match where like you get like the uh, uh, you get like the insane uh, partway across the ring uh, somersault sent on that Masato Yoshino holds someone up for and just like. The, the the idea of speed muscle they hit these moves and they immediately just like stand up and just go like yeah we just did that and that's an its own singular thing in a way and it worked really well here and i think like the thing that really like kind of like got me about this is that i remember that in 2017 for a while it was every single match of masato yoshino you're kind of watching through your hands you're like oh god i don't want anything bad happening here and he takes and, and he smartly was like oh no all the uh, the heat should be on me to start this match and they built it around there and it just completely just knowing each other's offense so well and the idea in the finishing stretch that like ck1 were such long champions at this time that naruki toy masato yushino scouted their offense they scouted out the meteora into the bible they, they scouted all the things here that it required dragon kid to pull out the big gun in the end to win the match and it's just one of those things that like four guys doing a match that was really unique for 2017 and can't really ever be duplicated in my mind. Yeah, I think the current roster certainly has the talent to put on a match of this caliber, which in my my review in 2017, I gave this match four and a half stars. I, I might even bump it up a quarter star now, but something that, that Mike and I talk about on the show all the time is just the house style of this promotion has changed so much and it might it be alienating to, it, it might be alienating to some longtime fans i personally love the style i i am in love with a lot of what this promotion is doing right now in 2021 because i think the in ring is so interesting but there is a, a clear generational shift and i think it it really starts to happen with the class of 2016 and skywalker and ben k and yuki yoshioka where they are not doing the same thing that a Yoshino was doing, that a Shima was doing, that a Dragon Kid was doing. So I think the talent is still there. But yeah, this is a match that definitely feels of another era in the context of modern Dragon Gate. Yeah, I love a lot. A lot of the sequences in the matches, like you said, it does not feel like modern Dragon Gate. It does feel like that, that prior era. And and yeah, there's just I mean, Dragon, Dragon Kid, I think in this match, you know, him and Yoshino, I, I you know, obviously the long history between those two guys just incredible work between each other as well. And especially, you know, working off of one another and, and, and just being able to, you know, just do stuff that, that just seamless transitions between one thing and the other, you know, dragon kid, you know, doing the, the, the dragon Rana out there, but uh, you know, Shima and Yoshino, I think in this match were really stood out to me as well. It's just like, Oh my God, these guys are just so, so good. And it, it is, uh, it is unfortunate. Like you said, it is missing from this modern dragon game. It's, it's made me, I, I still, I still love dragon it. I still really do, really do enjoy it, but there's something to be said about this. And when I watched this match, I was just like, ah, Ah, yes, this this was what I really fell in love with. This was the company that really kind of made me think, oh, my God, I, I have to watch everything I can from this company. And it's waned a little bit in, in, in the most recent years. But, uh, yeah, this this one, I mean, Yoshino, I can't say that he's the star of this match, but he is definitely I mean, and, and that's kind of speaks to Dragon and speaks to our entire point that we've said is like he's rarely ever like the guy in a match that you go, oh, my God, that match is good because of him. But he's just so good in this match. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's 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 hard to describe, but he is just a, an integral piece of, of this match and that entire era uh, of, of Dragon Gate. 
let me see if I can get Mike in trouble here as we kind of wrap things oh, up. Oh, now so I'm interested. Yeah, it. let's go. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing I love more than making Mike a little nervous on this podcast. Uh, Rich made a tremendous Shawn Michaels, Bret Hart comp earlier on when we were talking about this match, and he just echoed my thoughts. I was rereading my review earlier today, and the thing that I mentioned is Yoshino and Shima specifically just have this unbelievable chemistry in this match. They look like two guys that were born to wrestle and they were, you know, Yoshino now currently with his office position and his promotion looming behind the scenes in Dragon Gate and his role as the face of the promotion. Shima obviously had that at one point. Mike, what can you say about the personal differences between the way that Shima might handle business compared to the way Yoshino handles business? Oh, you're going right for the juggler and getting Mike in trouble department tonight. Okay. All right. Well, let's do this. Uh, Masato Yoshino, and Case, I know you know this very well. He is he is someone that preaches perfection. And that's something that when he's done training in Dragon Gate, he kind of that that the, the days that he leads, it would be like you're gonna we're, we might do something really simple as training, but we're gonna get this done perfectly. And it's one of those things that once you have this thing done perfectly, you can go build upon that. Uh I would say Shima in a lot of ways. He does preach perfection, but he also bends what his opinion of perfection is according to whether or not someone like he likes them. I think that's a fair thing to say, to say Case, without me getting into too much trouble right now. No, I I think that's fair. I, I think their relationship or lack thereof is yeah. a very interesting topic because they they've really I you know to my knowledge held very similar positions both as you know outward facing personalities of this promotion but also behind the scenes but you know we've talked to wrestlers about working with Shima and working with Yoshino both of them will have very positive things to say about Shima or Yoshino, but the things they say about them will be drastically different. And in a, they're like a Cold War HBK Bret Hart, because I don't know of any specific blowups that they've had. We've talked on this show uh, previously about the relationships between Shima and Shingo and Shima and Tozawa. Those are very heated. Those are public knowledge at this point. I don't know of anything between Shima and Yoshino that that's concrete, but yeah. just knowing the little bit I know about their personalities, it's always interesting now in hindsight going back and watching those two wrestle. And it's something that is worth stating that I don't think this is parting the curtain too much. Uh, basically, uh, Masato Yoshino inherited Shima's role in the company, including future roles in the company. So it's very much uh, the two Spider-Mans pointing at each other, or more so Looper in that regard but yeah no it's one of those <laughs> things that i would say that shima has a very set mind whereas yoshino in a lot of ways is very open and is someone that i i i mean it it's very hard to say like what like his idea of what perfect professional wrestling is because he does not talk about it we all know shima's we all know shima's he's very front and center i mean look at anything that has his fingers on it and you see shima is like very there masato yoshino is not that kind of person look at ricochet look at how he looks and how he wrestles that is shima's version of professional wrestling oh. that is everything that he's ever wanted <laughs> case K case here's where i think look at shima or, or look at ricochet look at pack oh god damn that is such a good point mike and that's something that alan forel mentioned <laughs> on one of the the shows we did on the torch was like just the dichotomy of ricochet and pock where Ricochet is this dork on Twitter who's constantly getting ducked, dunked on. He's at a terrible spot in his career, and he's in denial of it. You would never have Pac in people's mentions going, I actually, I had a really good match on, on Dark this week. You guys should actually check it out. Dark is kind of like the A show of AEW when you think about it. It's like, no. Pac handles his business just like Masao Yoshino, who's not on social media, who can't be found anywhere. This man likes baseball and sports cars, and he likes going to work in Dragon Gate, and he handles his business. And that is a tremendous, tremendous comp, Mike Spears. Yeah, yeah. I mean, let's put it this way. Uh, Pac was a partially Dragon Kid and partially Yoshino, but professionalism-wise, Pac is someone that, from talking to his peers and talking to people that know him, is and I hate using this word now in wrestling, almost impeachable, impeachable opinion about him as a person. Ricochet, you know, that's not necessarily this. And it kind of works with who their uh, mentors were.
And with that, <laughs> the career of Masato Yoshino. <laughs> yeah, awesome, yeah, 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 yeah. W- w- with that, uh, that's going to wrap it for this edition of Speed Star. Looking at the schedule with Okinawa getting pulled, we might be having another one of these in a few weeks. Rich, so thank you so much for coming aboard and doing this. We had an absolute blast. Yeah, th- th- thank you for having me on board. I, I hate that it has to be this reason it has to be you know the end of of his career that we have to come in and, and talk about this but uh i mean he's had a, just an incredible incredible career and i i do think he is one of these guys that, and 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 it's true probably of a lot of dragging it guys that maybe right now are not appreciated enough on the level like like you appreciate him the listeners of the show uh, appreciate him but i don't know if the the intelligentsia of, of wrestling quite appreciates you know how good yoshino is and how important he was to the history of of of, of japanese wrestling how important he was to just the history of of as you said you know, the influence of Pac right there, you know, the influence of many, many other, you know, people that watched him and were trained, you know, directly by him. I don't think we're, I don't know that he's going to get his due until probably many, many years down the line when people maybe go back and, and rediscover Dragon Gate stuff or people do greatest wrestler ever things in 2035 or something like that and, and go back and relook and go, Oh my God, this guy's incredible. And I just hope that at some point he does get his due or maybe, Hey, you know, maybe we're doing it right here. Maybe we are doing it and people will listen and go, God damn, this guy is one of the greatest, you know, wrestlers of all time. Maybe we do that on the show. I, I don't know. Hopefully we do. And if not, I hope it happens in the future because uh, he absolutely, absolutely deserves it. And uh, yeah, I appreciate you guys having me on. It was, it was a lot of fun. I'll let the record state that I have Masato Yoshino as my 20th top wrestler of all time. So you're doing your job. That's good. I appreciate it. I, I, <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I did not get nearly enough pushback for my, for my greatest wrestler ever opinion. So I'm just going to put that out there free and clear. So a lot of people can get real mad at that. If I didn't already get people mad at me about talking about Shima, versus uh masato yoshino uh case you have anything else you want to hit on before we get out of here uh no mike much much like last week when uh you were like i hope i'm not going too far and then when we stopped recording i was like no you were fine i there (laughs) there was nothing there i think this week you're fine again uh for for reference i have masato yoshino as my 34th greatest wrestler of all time and that is my my final opinion to have on this podcast uh, Rich Krejci, in case people don't know you, but also listen to this show, is there anything that you would like to let people know about? Uh, I would just say uh, voice wrestling.com. Obviously, I uh, read uh, the, the cases, reviews and, and open the voice gate and all the other podcasts and, uh, uh, and columns and previews we have on the website as well. The uh, voice wrestling flagship where uh, sometimes we're talking about dragging it, usually in the third hour, sometimes in the overrun, usually it gets uh, pushed back. But hey, we're, we're, we're trying. We're, you know, King of Gate has been, hey, with New Japan being bad and and not running, <laughs> we have, uh, Dragon Gate has gotten much, much more plub in the uh, the recent uh, uh, Voice Wrestling flagship. So you can listen there. Uh, and also our Patreon, patreon.com slash Voices of Wrestling, where we do a lot of, uh, a lot of retro uh, content, a lot of retro Japanese content. Uh, as well, current uh, 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 news and notes and stuff like that as well. And and I've always I've always had an idea of going and, and, and watching some retro Dragon Gates. So maybe we'll, we'll do that sometime soon uh, to to try to uh, try to entice you know just to get people. Maybe yeah, maybe for Yoshino. Maybe I'll just go and watch some some old Yoshino matches. Who knows what's going to happen? But uh, Patreon.com uh, slash Voices Wrestling for that. But more than anything, just Voices Wrestling.com and and support everything we do at the website, including what Case does, what Mike does, and and and, and everybody uh, that contributes to the website. So Voices of Wrestling.com. I don't think there's a better way for us to go out on other than addendum 23rd, not 20th, 23rd. Oh, pff, I don't want to be. Jeez, at. why do, why do you hate him so much? Like, come on. I, I, mean, I thought why you liked him. him? <laughs> yeah. Well, why do I hate him more than Stan Hansen, Bret Hart, and Asha? Yeah, Kong? come on. Those are scrubs. Come yeah. on. What? Yeah, absolute scrubs. But you can follow the podcast at Open Voice Gate. You could follow myself at Fuji Heyo, two eyes like Don Fuji. You can follow Case at underscore in your case. That's going to do it for this episode of speed star we'll be back in the the near future talking more about the life and times of masato yoshino take care